Thanks for joining We've Got Issues. I'm Nancy Furness, and We've Got Issues is a nonpartisan citizens based forum where we look at topics of concern to the Tri Cities. And we're filming on location today at the Fountainhead Network in Port Coquitlam. And I'd like to thank Tri Cities Community Television for making this program possible. I'd also like to acknowledge that the interview today is taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Coquitlam First Nations. So we are grateful and thank the Coquitlam um, people for um, continuing to protect the lands and the waters and all that are uh, all that is above and below. So today I'm joined by Rob Bottos, who is taking a run for Coquitlam City Council. So welcome, Rob. Thanks, Nancy. This is actually my second run for Coquitlam Council. Um, in 2018, I was a first line candidate for Tri City Council. And I came close. I placed in the top 13th. Uh, basically, Steve King beat me by 1,861 votes. Darn it. <laughs> well, it was a good first run at it. And it was a I'm great experience. I'm sure you had lots of um, lessons learned that you could take away from that. Okay. I was wondering, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that and a little bit about your background in general, um, just who you are and, and how you came to run for city council um, the first time and, and the second time. Sure. Um, well, as you put out, my name is Rob Bottas. Um, I've lived in Coquitlam since 1978, so for 44 years. When I came here in 78 with my mom and my sister, a single mom with two children could afford to buy a home in Coquitlam at that time. And here we are 44 years later, and that single mom with two children would be challenged to find a place to rent, let alone own. Mm -hmm. And um, growing up in a single parent family, there were a lot of struggles in this, you know, but I had a lot of, I benefited a lot growing up here. I mean, it's a beautiful community to grow up in. Um, I was in scouts, little league baseball, um, I left to go to university, but when I got my degree, I came back to Coquitlam, and as an adult member of this community, I mean, I volunteered for over 16 years with Scouts Canada as a scout leader. I've been involved with Little League Baseball as a coach. I volunteered with the Royal Canadian Legion Coquitlam branch for over 25 years, helping out the Poppy campaign because those are, I mean, you need, if you're going to be in community, you have to be part of your community. Right. And if you're going to, you got to be seen to leading by example. And that's one of the things I learned in scouting was that you have, you can't just be seen. You have to be. You have to set the example of what of what you want to see in community. Right, and I, I think all those experiences that you've had volunteering, um, what can you take from those experiences? Like, how will those benefit you as a city councillor? Well, I think what I take away is that a person's ability to contribute to community isn't just based on their financial wherewithal. I mean, look at me. I mean, I come from. I come. From, I came from a poor family, but you can't put a dollar value on the contributions I've made to this community. But I mean, mm -hmm. if we hadn't lived here, that experience would be missing from the community. I think everybody has a way to contribute, whether they're a senior citizen, whether they have a, whether a disability, single, married, what have you. We can all contribute to community with the skill set that we have. My skill set that I've, I guess, worked on is that uh, I'm a people person. Um, right. I like to have conversations with people. I try to find ways to connect with people because while we all have our own views, quite often, even if we have different views, we actually have more in common if we can mm -hmm. find a way to have that conversation. And like when I'm knocking on doors for various candidates, I'm always finding out what can I what can I use to connect with this person? Do they have, do they have a pet? Do they have a nice car in the driveway? You know, are they wearing a nice colored shirt? You find something to engage with the person. From there, you never know where the conversation is going to go. Well, and I think being a people person is a really um, important aspect, right? If you don't like people, then this is probably not a good place for you. Um, and you do, you're well known in the community for your um, volunteer work. How, what inspired you to take those experiences and put them towards, um, once again, um, looking to serve the community as a city councillor? Well, in actually in 2010, um, sorry, 2012, I became a homeowner. Um, although I should say the bank owns most of the home, the right. very little tiny condo that I have. And I just started looking at, you know, the costs that I'm incurring as a, as a member of the city. Mm -hmm. And through my involvement with the trade union movement, if you want, you have to be, the, your union is only as good as the people that get involved. And so I wanted to get involved and find out what I could do to help make Coquitlam a better community. So in 2014, um, I actually tried out, uh, made a run for uh, trustee. Um, didn't do so well, but I learned a bit. Mm -hmm. um, but then I just started thinking about it and... I knew that where I, where my skill set was most wanted or most suited my needs was city council. I had people say, well, you know, you, you should run for trustee first, get elected first. 
And I'm like, but I don't have any children. My skill set is more suited to what goes on at city at the city council table. And then I started looking at the makeup of our city council, and I saw a lot of people that were rather well off, and I didn't really see any pe people that had really struggled. And of course, as you know now, with the changing of the campaign financing rules, and mm -hmm. if you're well off, you know people are going to write twelve hundred dollar checks like that. Whereas someone who works, you know, who's working poor or who makes forty to forty five thousand dollars a year, it's a real struggle. I mean, yeah, it was a challenge in 2018 to raise the money I raised. It's even more challenging now with COVID. But I think that's that voice is missing yeah. the table, I think. It's a really valid point. Um, so if you have those connections, the fundraising is, is much easier, and that's one challenge that can be more uh, quickly overcome if you're already established. So, um, yeah, that's one of, of a, a number of lessons that I, I think you probably learned from last time. Mm -hmm. Is there any other lessons that you learned that you can put towards um, your run this time? Yeah, start talking to people sooner. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, but be present in the community. Be mm -hmm. engaged. Don't just show up during the election cycle. You have, you've got, I mean, I've been uh, I've been serving on the Universal Access Access Ability Advisory Committee for over five years. Um, recently, I, I joined the, the Tri Cities Homelessness and Housing Task Force because I've had lots of interactions with the homeless, and I just think they're being left by the wayside. And so if you want the job, be present for the job that you want. How are, like, you've had so many um, volunteer experiences, a, a wide range in diversity. How will that, um, or will that, determine the priorities that you have if you are successful in getting a, a, um, a position on city council? Maybe if you could tell us your just very briefly, your top two or three priorities, and then we can delve into them a little bit deeper. Um, affordable housing, obviously, I mean, affordable housing was a topic in 2018. Mm -hmm. If anything, I think it's gotten worse. I mean, the city has been building more units, but unless you build the right kind of units, you're not going to build your way out of a housing affordability crisis. So what are the right kind of units? Well, we, we need to look at the... Uh, the housing needs assessment report that was done for the city of Coquitlam. Like right now, 23% um, of our renters are in purpose-built rentals. The other 70, if my math is right, math is never my strong point, <laughs> the other 77% uh, are on the secondary market. To me, that number mm -hmm. should be flipped around. I mean, over 40% of our renters are housing stressed. They're paying more than what they can afford. We need more purpose-built rental in this community. Um, we don't need, I mean, we've got, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. It's just, it's just lopsided. I mean, we, mm -hmm. we need rental housing. We need affordable renting housing. We need cities that agree on what affordable means. Right. One community to the next has different definitions of what constitutes affordability. I go by what CMHC says. No more than 30% of your before um, tax income should be spent on housing. If I was a renter right now, I couldn't. I live in a one-bedroom uh, apartment. Or a condo, I can't. I can't afford twelve or fourteen hundred dollars a month of rent. So I don't know how our renters are affording that. It's it's criminal. I mean that we're losing people because they can't afford to be here. Where are they going to go? Right. So as a city councillor, how how could you promote that? Um, what actions could you take to? I'm constantly talking about it till the developers buy into the vision that we have for the city. Developers will build what they want until we tell them what we need them to build. No. City of Coquitlam believes in incentives. Incent incentives are great as long as they work. Mm -hmm. If the incentives don't work, then you have to be prepared to do something else. But I think if we had an overall vision that Coquitlam is a home to everybody and get the developers to buy into that vision, maybe they'll start building the housing that we need and not just what they can profit off of. You know, I'm all for profit, but sometimes, you know, if it's about community, maybe you make a little less profit, but it, but it builds a better community. Mm -hmm. And community yes. looks smoke for each other. So um, do I hear you correctly in saying that you um, think that maybe we're not asking enough of our developers, that we should be maybe holding them a little more accountable for the affordable housing strategy and that they also have a role to play in that? They have a role to play because mm -hmm. they're building the housing that's going to house our people for the next 30, 40, 50, 60 years. And, but also as a city, we have the obligation to, if, to be advocating to other levels of government, both provincial and federal. And for years, they've been offloading those costs on the city. Well, we as a city can't pay for that. We are a partner, but we're not the only partner in the creation of affordable housing. The other levels of government must do their job. But then we also have to be willing to work with those levels of government. 
Again, we have a provincial government that offered, they offered modular housing to Coquitlam. Coquitlam said no. Okay. You know, whereas the Coquitlam, they've been basically saying, you put up the land, we'll build the modular housing. So where is the problem there? Is it because um, lack of land or not wanting to I really put that land up? I really don't know. Um, I, I mean, I can, I can honestly say, I don't think people want to leave the homes outdoors. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they're like, well, they're not in my backyard, so it's okay. Right. People complain about the homeless, but the part of the problem though is that 3030 Gordon has been full since the day we built it. Yes. And Coquitlam is paying the costs for the homeless in the Tri-Cities. What is Port Moody doing? What is Port Coquitlam doing? For years, Maple Ridge refused to, to do their share for their home. They, they were allowing their homeless populations to go elsewhere. Burnaby did the same thing for years. Every community has a responsibility to the vulnerable, in their, whether it be battered women shelters, whether it be emergency housing, whether it be transitional housing, mm -hmm. every community, if it's a complete community, has all those aspects in their community. When you say a complete community, can we talk about that a little bit more? Um, part of it would be what you've just said is making sure that everyone has a home and that we don't have homeless people that are looking somewhere else to live. Um, what else would a complete community, like what is your vision of a complete community in as far as Coquitlam goes? Well, a community where you can live, work and play. You don't have to commute to Vancouver. You don't have to commute to city. I got commuted to North Vancouver for two and a half years. Right. That drive, that commute, I mean, that commute almost literally killed me just in traffic. I couldn't stand it. We, you know, we don't want Coquitlam to be a, a satellite for other communities. We want good paying jobs here. Part of the affordability is if you create good paying jobs in the community, people can afford the housing that's here. Right. So you're not having all that commute, all that, even like a carbon footprint. Um, there's a lot of aspects that go along with having a community where you can live, work and play, as you say. You have your doctors, you have your schools, mm -hmm. you have your entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, like right now in Coquitlam, we almost have four separate communities. We've got Mallardville, we've got Como Lake, we've got our upcoming city core, and we've got Burke Mountain. Nothing really unifies those four communities. We need to find something that brings us all together. Um, but one of the reasons I like the housing first strategy is that once a person is housed, mm -hmm. they can then begin to get better and become functioning members of our community. And when a person is housed, the cost of crime, the cost of poverty are alleviated and that frees up money in your city because cities are spending money on poverty and crime mm -hmm. that really aren't our responsibility. If the federal provincial governments did their share, we would have more money to do, to do the jobs we're supposed to do. Roads, sewers, infrastructure. Right. And perhaps those taxes would be, you know, might go down. Okay, yeah. I, it sounds like there's a lot of <laughs> work ahead here. So it's, um, it's, it's, there's no quick fix, unfortunately, because, you know, we, we dug ourselves into this hole and it's going to take commitment to dig our way out. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone, that, what everybody has to pull together if, if they have a vision for this community. And my vision is a community that we can all live in right. and interact with each other. Um, I think another thing, uh, there's so many challenges when we talk about having um, complete communities, we talk about um, development, housing, people, different types of housing. Um, do you, what types of housing do you think we need? Like, we need to house the homeless folks. Um, what else do we need in Coquitlam? We really need more affordable and non-market housing. And that can happen in the form of, you know, with buy-in from the federal government, we get more co-ops. Because co-ops mm -hmm. have people paying market rate, people paying below market and non-market, but they, they, they support each other, they subsidize each other. We have to get past this, I've got mine, too bad for, you know. Right. We have to get more of a collect. and I know this is a, a collective vision of what community is. And community means just that. We are a community. We have different experiences, we have different backgrounds, we have different abilities. But we're all contributing to that community to make it a better place for everybody. You don't just leave someone, you know, laying in the street. Right. At the same time, you know, uh, you want to support local businesses because local businesses are the heart and soul of your community. You know, I'd rather walk to my local coffee plus vanilla to a block from my house than go to a Starbucks. Personally, I'd rather, you know, I'd rather go to a, a little boutique shop than a, than a box store. We have to find ways mm -hmm. of getting more small businesses into our community. So as a city councillor, what could you do or what would you do to try and support and maybe even attract small business into the community? Well, I, um, I'm going to be honest with you. I have a background in history, um, not economics. So mm -hmm. I'm going to be, I, I would rely on the advice of others who know more than me, but I'm also going to do some of my own research. Right. Like when I was a, when I was a union, when I was a union steward, 
Um, I might not have the answer the member needed, but I, I was always committed to helping them find the answer to get the information. And I don't know something, I'm willing to learn. And I think that's a great example of how your previous experience will pay, play into um, how you um, navigate things as a city councillor, recognizing the importance of doing your own work, but also listening and learning to others that you know may be able to mentor a little bit too. As a scout leader, mm -hmm. uh, when, I, when I organized a challenge camp for the district of Kuku, you know, I got these guys here to run the water activities. These guys did the cooking activities. I just drew on people's various experiences and strengths to together. Exactly. Mm. And so you have to learn how to delegate. You have to learn how to listen. Um, and you have to be able to be able to see out to see a different viewpoint, because if you get locked yeah. into one viewpoint, all you got to do is change your angle a bit, and, you, and it opens up a whole new different perspective. Perspective for yeah. you. Yeah. And mm. especially at the civic level, you have to want to work with people. You can't let personal bias or ideology. You have to be because we're all here for the same reason to help this community. And if you allow yourself to become polarized and not see the other person as an equal person, you get, you get gridlock. Right, and right. I know that some cities have parties. I'm actually glad that Coquitlam doesn't have parties at the civic level because it means that your community, you have to work with your other mm -hmm. seven councillors and mayor if you want to get something done. Right, so you're not working along party lines or you're dividing working, that working way. In the community. Right. Because you could be a liberal, I could be a new Democrat, we might have different ways of paying for it, but we still agree on we want you know we want roads, we want schools, we want housing. So where do we have the conversation to get to the point where we both? You've got the way? same goal. Exactly. And how you get there is how you discuss and negotiate, and maybe that's part of your job is figuring out a path that works yeah. for everybody. Exactly. It's one of the mm. scouting. You know, the, the, the youth learn to build by consensus. You know, you have leaders. You don't have bosses. And so by, by listening to people's opinions, everybody feels valued and they, they all make a contribution to the end goal. It sounds like um, you've got some good sort of, um, um, I don't know, a, a way forward and, and a willingness to work together. So that I'm I think... I'm always willing to work with people. Yeah, it, 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 something that definitely <laughs> is a big attribute when you get on council. Um, I guess one thing... Um, when we talk about complete communities as well, one thing that comes to my mind, um, I have an interest in trees and green spaces. And when we are looking at these complete communities, we know that there's going to be development. We know that things will change over time. There will be densification and, and things like that. I know that you've mentioned um, previously about um, encroachment on wildlife mm -hmm. habitat when trees come down. Um, how would you address sort of maintaining green spaces or at least finding a balance? You've got to strike a balance. Like well, I always hate it. Like I, like I work at the Safeway liquor store and I drive through the neighborhoods and I've seen all those lots that have been clear cut. And every time I see all those big trees mm -hmm. taken down, it just really gets me. Now I know that developers are going to, they're going to clear, but I just wish we could find a way to, like you build your building, but let's try and keep some of those trees because you know, mm -hmm. they, because as you know, the tree cover helps the environment. It helps cool places off. It gives the birds a place to live, and birds are important because I, I like the sound of birds in the community. But with also with wildlife, um, part of it is education. Um, as a scout leader, I would take kids camping in the backwoods, and it's learning how you interact with nature. You can enjoy nature, but minimizing your impact. And right. one of the reasons, of course, we're seeing lots of bear. I mean, we're, we've pushed all the way up Burke Mountain. Um, we have people that aren't securing their garbage properly, so naturally the bears are going to come into our community. Yeah, I think education is the first part of reducing that problem, but also densify where densification makes sense. You know, we don't need okay. to push all the way to the top of that mountain. You and can, where you need wildlife spaces in order to have recreation as well. Where does densification make the most sense? Along SkyTrain roads, and unfortunately, our provincial government. They're late to the game where they said, oh, we need to have affordable housing along SkyTrain. I mean, you can't yeah. tell me they didn't know that I was going to lift the land value. And so in Coquitlam, it, I think it's a little late to try to get affordable housing along the SkyTrain lines, but we can definitely get it within walking distance of, I hope. So we've got an issue now with land values right around SkyTrain stations going up. So you're saying affordable housing now is more challenging right around there. So we need to spread out a little bit, um, still be in proximity, but maybe now being right next to a SkyTrain is not 
No. Not realistic any longer. Unless, of course, we find a way for developers to partner with not profits, mm -hmm. create non market units within their development. That's one way. But, in, but until the developers buy into that vision, it's not going to happen, unfortunately. Is there something that, as a city councilor, you could do to encourage developers to maybe? Um, be a little bit more cognizant of, of those sort of aspects? Well, I think as a city, because if, if, it's, if it's just one person, one person will get nothing done. But if the city adopts the same view, mm -hmm. you have a greater chance of selling that vision and, devel and for developers to buy into that vision. Mm -hmm. One person alone will get the job done. Um, so as much as, I, I mean, I'm not afraid to talk about the issues, but unless I can get a team of people working with me, unfortunately, right. developers aren't going to buy in. Right, so it's important to work with your colleagues and your peers to, yeah. Um, I'm going to change tack uh, just a little bit. I know that you've done a lot of work in the Tri-Cities um, with, like, the Homelessness Task Force. You've worked with a lot of uh, people with disabilities and a lot of experience, and you bring all of that with you, um, if you're successful in getting on city council, you bring a lot of experience in that area. Um, do you feel right now that uh, people with disabilities are adequately supported by the city in, in Coquitlam? They're not adequately supported by the federal, provincial, or city. And of course, really, it's not the city's responsibility to provide supports for persons with disabilities. Okay. That is a provincial responsibility, it's also a federal responsibility. Our job, I mean, we zone lands. We can advocate, we can be a better advocate for persons with disabilities, we can be a better leader. Like one thing that City of Coquitlam is will be adopting that came as a result of participation to the Universal Accessibility, Universal Accessibility Advisory Committee, they're going to be looking at a diversity, equity, employment, or diversity, equity, inclusion strategy. So for any employment they do, they're going to be looking at it through a DEI lens. That's they, the city is doing that's that. That's the city. Okay. So if the city does that, maybe other businesses will do it as well. But you know, someone has to, someone has to take the first step. Um, I worked 11 years with persons with physical and cognitive disabilities, and one of the greatest challenges of finding employment is to get to, is for employers to get employers to see these people as employable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They get locked into this is they have to do all these tasks, and it's like there's a thing called job carving. You've got 10 tasks. You can only get to seven of them. Well, let's take those three. Let's take those two and that one. Now we've created another job. If 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 that person with Down syndrome to do the job effectively has to have the support in the workplace, why not? Right, right. Studies have shown that persons with disabilities, you know, they show up, they do their jobs, they don't mm -hmm. call in sick. They love being able to contribute to the community. I mean, I took one, one young fellow to a local business and the guy said, well, we have one of those people here. And this young man was a person of color. And my inner monologue was like, I really wanted to go off on this guy, but I couldn't. But I mean, any kind of bullying or discrimination, because I, I, I've been bullied growing up with threat syndrome. Trust me, it was not fun growing up, um, being the being the shy, awkward kid who looked funny and made funny sounds mm. and funny movements. Not fun at all. So I have some, I have a lot of empathy for people that don't feel like they fit in in the community. Well, I think you bring up a couple of really good points. Um, first of all, you're talking about the city having a leadership role, um, so maybe they can show the way to have some of these more respectful relationships. And then secondly, one thing that we always like to talk about on We've Got Issues is respectful workplace. And I think you've touched on that a, a number of times already. Um, can you tell me, um, you know, like, how would you work with council to ensure that there was a respectful work? place well first thing i mean if you see if you see something say something um set the example i mean treat others i know this is going to sound funny but it's really simple treat others the way that you want to be treated yourself mm -hmm. and not just when the cameras are on you you right. have to you have to live the change you want to see and i know god that's gandhi's quote but it really rings true it's a you good one change you want to see <laughs> in the community and that yeah. starts with the individual responsibility little steps and if the if council sets the example, it all trickle. I, I hate the word trickle down, but it all <laughs> it all trickles down. Right. But I mean, there's no there's no place for bullying in the workplace. It still happens. I've been bullied in the workplace. It wasn't fun. Mm -hmm. you know, it had a re, it had a real negative effect on my mental health. And trust me, my mental health is very important to me because um, with one of the one of the things I've struggled with my entire life is depression as a result of the Tourette's and uh, and being bullied. So I you don't. Know, um, 
I like a respectful workplace because it means that I can focus on the skill set I have. I'm not worrying about someone stabbing me in the back or making fun of me or teasing me. That kind of stuff shouldn't happen in the workplace, period. Right. No, absolutely. And it sounds like you're very um, attuned to that, right? So a lot of empathy there. Um, there's been talk lately about having um, like an integrity commissioner or an ethics um, commissioner put into place to sort of oversee things at the municipal level in the case where there are issues that can't be resolved by, you know, within mayor and council themselves. Is that something that you would support? I think you start with a code of conduct. I mean, we have code of conducts, but they're never enforced. So mm -hmm. if you're going to have a code of conduct, make sure people know about it, make sure they actually live it. Right. And yeah, there's nothing wrong with having an ombudsperson to help to go to um, to resolve disputes. Because if like you have a toxic environment on council, you're still there for four years with those people. You've got to find a way to move past right. that. And if you don't have a respectful workplace, you can't get work done. That's true. You can get an awful lot more done working together in a positive exactly. atmosphere than, yeah. I also think, I mean, you know, we've had people that have been convicted of wrongdoing. There has to be a way to allow, you know, people that have been convicted of wrongdoing, you know, you've got a criminal record, you're not on city council. Right. Or, you know, if you're, or, or, or if you're up on charges, you're going to recuse yourself until such time as you've been cleared. Yeah. And right now, there's not a lot of guidance in that area. So perhaps this is an area that does need further um, work in the future. And some of that leadership can come from the provincial government because the provincial yes. government has the ability to change the charter for what mandates local government. And so yeah. they need to show the leadership in order for the civic governments to have the leadership. Okay, well, thank you so much. And thanks very much for joining us today. It was really nice to get to know you a little bit better and to find out what some of your priorities will be on council. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. This is We've Got Issues. And thanks again to Tri-Cities Community Television for making these interviews possible.